Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Midwest Ag This Week. I'm Stu Ellis, welcoming you to our program today, which is going to be phenomenal, I think. We're honored that you could join us. You're going to learn how ag education has exploded in popularity in Decatur's public schools and what's being done to make space. We'll travel to Europe and find out why farmers are farmers are farmers. Those carbon markets are going global. Soybean farmers are pushing new legislation in Springfield. We'll have all that and some new technology to fight corn rootworms, all coming to you right now. Welcome to Midwest Ag This Week with host Stu Ellis. Earthwork has begun on the first of its kind FFA Center south of Decatur. Philanthropist Howard Buffett's $9 million gift to the Andreas Ag Academy in the Decatur Public Schools will include physical structures, farmland, farm equipment, and a focal point for all FFA across central Illinois. Uh, so we'll have the building, uh, and in that building we'll have five classrooms and a, and a, uh, a workshop room and a few offices, and then we're going to have 15,000 square foot of open space in the back, which is free span, completely open, uh, and, and, and it's pretty good, you know, 15,000 square feet is pretty good size, and that will be, they can do things with horses, with cattle, with, you know, whatever they want to do. I mean, it, it, it gives them an opportunity to host, you know, unlimited amount of FFA chapters, whether it's in Illinois or outside of Illinois, they'll be able to bring lots of people together, uh, lots of other chapters together, and do different things with those chapters. And I just, I think it's, um, for me, the love I have for farming, uh, it's, it's probably the most fun thing I've done in Decatur. I mean, if you think about Decatur, this is the greatest ag story I know because you went to an urban school, over 50% color and over 50% female, and you have 435 of these students. Next year, they anticipate 500 involved in an agricultural program. Where has that ever happened before? Okay, so to me, it's an incredible story, and it means that all of these students now get exposed to things they never thought about. And you've already, you know, we've got some of the stories of the kids who already went down to U of I. Uh, you know, they're ag, ag science, ag marketing. Uh, you know, I don't expect any of them to figure out how they can go farm. I mean, you know, I, I don't see that, but I see hundreds of kids coming out of Decatur, Illinois, that are going to be able to go to a college and learn something about agriculture and have an agricultural career that they would never have had if we hadn't developed this program. And thank you to Howard Buffett for doing that. Well, it seems the challenges to American farmers are parallel to those of European farmers. At least that's what a delegation from Illinois Farm Bureau found out in a trip earlier this month to several European nations. But in the middle of the trip, the Ukraine conflict upended Europe's new trade policy. With the issues in Ukraine, that certainly came first, you know, front and center, if you will, into many of the discussions. But when you when you look at what were kind of the key takeaways, the thing that struck me as we talked about the three or four areas that we were over there to talk about, which was farm policy, environmental policy, trade, and the rural urban divide, is first of all, um, we heard repeatedly how um, much they envied organizations like Illinois Farm Bureau and our commodity organizations here in Illinois to have the opportunity and the ability to advocate and affect whether it's legislation or regulation like we do. So I hope that you know the listeners and our members out there don't take that for granted. That's certainly a, a benefit that we enjoy in the U.S. The other thing that struck me was, you know, farmers are farmers are farmers. And their issues, their challenges, whether it's labor availability, the age, uh, aging demographics of their farm community, environmental regulations, uh, farm policy, just the challenges, if you will, of agricultural inputs right now, um, they, they mirror our same issues here in the United States. And so I'm of the opinion that if you let farmers really sit down and go farmer to farmer, we could solve an awful lot of these issues uh, and find a way forward. But as we all know, that there's a lot of other factors that enter into that. So it was a different kind of trip for us this year, one that was very much not just focused on trade, but was really focused on a number of other things. The trade issue became suddenly it 
turned around right when you were there. It really did. Um, so obviously Europe is focused on food security. And when we went over to talk about the EU proposal of farm to fork, which is their environmental proposal to say we'll buy products from the U.S. if you cut back fertilizers 50 percent and pesticides and these sorts of things. All of a sudden it was, um, we're not sure we really want to worry about that right now. We want to make sure we have food. Um, and understandably so. Again, it's a very serious situation and it's right there on their borders and they're going to be impacted by it first. Make sure we have food. Yes. Not here, but everywhere. Yeah. And you're looking at weather maps that are concerning. That's right. We've got uh, spots that are seeing rain where they don't necessarily need as much of it and places that need the rain are still staying dry and things are not warming up. So yeah, there's some there's some issues there. There's some issues there. So um, here we are with our first off though with our soil temperatures and they've actually kind of decreased a little bit here over the past week as some cooler air has worked its way into our area. Chance for precipitation will be going up though. We're thinking by the mainly the middle of next week with another large low pressure system that will move across a majority of the Midwest with a lot of us seeing upwards of uh, three quarters of an inch to maybe closer to an inch and a quarter of rain. The thing is though we're pretty much okay with our rain. A little bit was needed last week, which we already saw, but we'd like to see more of this rain from this next system be a bit farther more off to the west where they need it a bit more. But we do have the chance for some uh, pretty mild temperatures to go along with these rain showers and possibly even storms too as a very robust low pressure system comes through. Would not be surprising if there will be a chance for some severe weather down in the uh, southeast along the southern edge of the cold front when that passes on through. Uh, but that would again be for next week starting mainly for us Tuesday going into Wednesday. You're going to see though that our temperatures are really going to be uh, a bit cool here for the rest of the weekend and into early next week. The thing is though there's going to be a boundary that does set up and it's going to be right across a lot of the Midwest. So some of us are going to stay cool north of that front. Others are going to be quite warm into the 70s. But once that front does begin to push on up, we should all be looking to be a lot warmer. We're thinking on Wednesday that would be the case where most of us would end up being uh, pretty mild. But our 8 to 14 day outlook still trends cooler than normal for the first week of April. And in terms of our precipitation, it's about normal with again the spots that you'd like to see with a little bit more in the way of some rain still not really seeing a lot of it. Our latest drought monitor does call for a lot of that extreme drought that you can still see across Texas and Oklahoma. A lot more of the Midwest is okay. Northwest Illinois for example is still a little dry but again the uh, the plains still very dry. The world needs our wheat because they're not going to get Russian and uh Ukrainian wheat. This is correct, and that's where it is. That's and exactly so where to, it is. We need to get it some rain there. Global Carbon, right after this. Welcome back to Midwest Ag This Week. Have you signed on to a carbon credit program? Uh, question mark. Some farmers have, some farmers haven't. Maybe you're waiting for find out what your neighbor's doing. Indigo Ag made an initial wave in that pond, and Chief Strategy Officer Chris Harbert says he's expanding to other continents because of the demand from companies wanting carbon offsets. You know, two years ago, we were out kind of beating the bushes and trying to find the first groups who would get excited about carbon credits, and the phone just rings off the hook. The, the, the demand for these credits um, is huge. You know, I've, I've said there's approximately five Earths worth of demand. You know, if you took all the agriculture on Earth, it, we would need five Earths to meet the demand right now of the phone calls that are coming in. So I have, I have great confidence for agriculture that there will be a market into the future for these credits and that it's worth farmers investing in learning about carbon and starting to uh, get familiar with how to produce these credits. We're working on a number of pilots in Europe, we're working in India, um, and we're thinking about South America and the right ways to roll those out. One of the, the keys, we're, we're really in the first few years of the U.S. We want to make sure we do the U.S. right and that we build the technology correctly before we make the mistakes in three places. We'll, we'll, we'll get things right here first. Had Ukraine been on your map? Ukraine, of course. Of course Ukraine had been on our map. So that's, a, that's an unfortunate situation there for the people on the ground and, and also a, a disruption in our ability to, to look at Ukraine. So are geopolitical events then, uh, do they really cause a big setback in anything? That's really about the economics on that field for that farmer. So I don't worry about geopolitics affecting the long-term permanence 
of uh, a practice because that field is going to grow wheat. It's going to grow wheat next year and the year after. It doesn't really um, depend on who's in power there um, as long as there's an economic incentive for that grower to do the right thing and adopt those new practices. Where it, where it becomes a little challenging is in the startup of a program. Who, who, do you, who do you speak to in the middle of a conflict? You can't, the division of agriculture isn't, isn't there in the office, so there's no way to get the programs off the ground. So it delays the start of programs in places like Ukraine, but it doesn't uh, impact our ability to do business there long term and bring carbon credit programs to those growers. Fortunately, politics is a little bit easier in Springfield than it is over in Ukraine because leaders of the Illinois Soybean Association converged on the state capitol Tuesday to lobby for their legislation that will boost the content of soybean oil in diesel fuel via a tax incentive. Board member Ron Kindred, who farms near Atlanta, is confident the legislation will pass. Well, we've met with uh, Senator Joyce, who is uh, carrying our uh, biodiesel legislation in the Senate, and uh, talked to him about where it's at and uh, you know what's what the future is. And uh, sounds like it's uh, it's got a lot of support, and no opposition. So he's expecting it to uh, get through the Senate here in the next week or so. So that's very positive news for us, and go on into the House. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, attached to a revenue package in the House. And uh, so we're hopeful we can get it through on this. Legislative consultant Pete Probst says the content of the soybean oil and diesel will be graduated upward for the tax incentive to apply. Yes, yeah, currently in Illinois we're looking at uh, a bill that's going to increase the blend um, requirement for the state sales tax incentive. And so right now we're at 11% B11. Uh, it allows you to get the 6.25% tax incentive uh, basically reduced. And so the, this current bill is going to increase it to a 20% blend in the future. And Kindred says that level is environmentally advantageous. We're wanting to ramp up to a B20 blend because it uh, it just kind of makes sense because uh, there's uh, uh, you know so much demand to uh, improve the uh, uh, environment and the climate and the B20 blend. The higher the biodiesel blend we have, the the more impact it has on carbon uh, reduction in the in the air. So it's uh, going to clean up the air. It's going to uh, create a little more demand for uh, soybean oil. And uh, it's all uh, produced here in Illinois, so it's kind of a win-win-win the way we see it. And the petroleum marketers are getting behind it. We've even got uh, the, our petroleum uh, friends that uh, they're, uh, they're neutral to even uh, coming on supporting it a little bit more than, uh, um, and that's, that's a big ch shift. You know, we haven't had that in the past. We've always kind of butted heads, and, uh, uh, and if we can get together and uh, protect the liquid fuel industry in the future, it's, it's for the best of both of us. And uh, more soybean oil and more soy diesel means more demand for soybeans. Sherm Newland's back there. Uh, he's nodding his head because he knows that means a boost for prices anyway, or supported for prices. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. So hopefully we can get that going and, and build upon that. Um, yeah, prices were higher today across the board. Uh, we had higher weekly closes. So that was good to see um, in most commodities. I mean, from corn to beans to crude to even gold. So that, that was uh, good to see. But as you know, we're talking about bean demand, we had a flash sale today of 132,000 tons to China of old crop beans. So that's, that was interesting. Then I also read a piece where they uh, were going to release uh, some of the reserves uh, to the Chinese uh, crushers because they're falling behind. And they've only been buying new crop beans. So the old crop purchase was, uh, that's, that's out of uh, trend anyway. Exactly, exactly. They, they usually buy most of the beans from uh, South America at this point. But I mean, they have been coming in and buying some sporadic uh, old crop bean sales. So that's, that's kind of building. And, you know, like you said earlier, with what was going on with Ukraine, I mean, we expect, uh, hopefully the exports to ramp up. Now we've got a big report coming out uh, uh, this next week, uh, acreage report, uh, uh, a lot of guesses out there. Yes, yes, they are a lot of guesses. We, we put out some numbers. We're probably going to be some of the lowest ones out there. I think the average tech trade guess is looking for 92 or so million acres of corn. We're under 90 at 89.7. And then we came in at 89.8, I believe, on, on beans. And then we upped our um, wheat acreage a little bit as well. But you're also having the quarterly grain stocks coming out. Um, you know, so we'll see if there's any surprises in that mix. So, uh... Folks need to uh, uh, develop their risk management plans ahead of that report on Thursday. 
uh, because it could be a major market mover. Sure. Yes, it very well could be. It, it wouldn't hurt for guys to have orders above the market in case something, you know, um, bullish comes out and you need to get something sold. Sure, we appreciate your help. Thank you, sir. Sherb sure, Newland, uh, our market advisor. And uh, we're going to be back with uh, a visit to a farm equipment dealer here in a minute. Over the past three years, a committee of farm equipment dealers across the U.S. and Canada has worked to reorganize regional and provincial organizations of farm equipment dealers. In the past week, 94% of all the dealers voted in favor of the plan. One of the leaders in that was a John Deere dealer down in South Central Illinois. One of those building blocks in Illinois agriculture is the implement dealerships not just in Illinois, but nationwide. And that's something we want to talk about today uh, with Jared Noby of uh, Seidenstricker Noby uh, John Deere dealership in Flora, because uh, you are one of the uh, uh, ones on a national and international committee that really uh, uh, gave some, some new reorganization to all of the, uh, the implement dealerships across the country and Canada. Yeah, we uh, started the committee probably about in 2018 to just to decide what is the best way to move forward. And there, the group originally started off with about 14 dealers in the room. Um, that when we ended up, we ended up with a core group of um, 12 dealers that were really trying to sit down and say, what does the future of the dealer association organization look like for dealers going forward? And why is that important? Uh, I don't think. Farmers may not really realize that you've got an organization yourself. Yeah, so the, the dealer association is important and very, I mean, it's very similar to the Farm Bureau. We need a group um, to advocate behalf on behalf of us as dealerships um, so that we can collectively as dealers get behind a good game plan on legislative affairs, manufacturers relations, um, and just our relationship with our customers in general to make that better. So really all the way up and down from manufacturers through customers. But you also mentioned uh, legislative affairs. Yep. Where do you get involved with state legislatures? So there's a couple of things that uh, we've really tried to do over the last couple of years to talk through. One is task force development. One of the significant challenges that we have in the dealership is finding really good young technicians or technicians of any age to continue to work and support our customers. And so working with the legislator to develop uh, programs, tuition credits, making sure that our trade schools are well, well funded so that we can continue to develop um, really good young people in our organizations. Uh, the other one that we work with quite a bit is on right to, right to repair, and I think right to repair has gotten a little bit of a stigma. We as dealers want to be very clear and work together to let everybody know and our customers know that we absolutely support our customers' right to repair their own equipment. We want to have the tools, we want to have the, uh, the, the tools, everything out there to be able that they can do that themselves. What we're concerned about is really just our right to modify. So taking an engine that's it's marked for 250 horsepower and taking up to 280. So we got to be careful with that and making sure that uh, we work together with the Farm Bureaus to, to be very careful what that legislation does. Well, some interesting times as far as agriculture, and it carries over to the associations of, uh, of all the farm equipment dealers. We appreciate uh, Jared Noby uh, joining us today. Some new rootworm control for you right after this. Let's talk about corn rootworms with U of I rootworm specialist Joe Spencer. First question is what will be the pressure on rootworms this year? And if you know you have fields with a problem, he says there's some new technology on the market. Listen to this. Here in the central part of the state, we've had lower populations, less of a potential for rootworm problems, but it all sort of depends on how the weather is in late May and June. If we have saturated soil conditions, that will really do a number on the rootworm populations, whether they're large or small. So I've got my fingers crossed. Uh, we'll see what happens. The new RANI technology is being pyramided with BT traits. This is something new. We haven't had two unique modes of action uh, out on the market to control rootworms for a long while now. It's now bulletproof, uh, and for everyone to get the 
sort of the best value out of this, we need to be careful when we use it and restrict its use to fields where we know we have a rootworm problem. Otherwise, we can select for resistance unnecessarily. So restrict to use where we know we've got a problem. Should farmers, how are farmers going to know, or did that require them to put up yellow sticky traps last year? <laughs> yeah, um, growers should be, you know, monitoring their fields to know what sort of pest levels they have. Um, growers who've had problems with BT resistance in the past, these are growers for whom um, the RNAi uh, BT pyramids are probably going to work best. Um, ideally, we want uh, growers to be monitoring, looking at their fields, and, and keeping an eye out for their problems, which would involve sticky trap monitoring, which they could begin this year for next year. Is there going to be a sufficient amount of this type of seed available uh, on the market this year? From everything that I've heard visiting with people from the technology providers, um, there's going to be seed. It's not going to be enough for everybody to have um, uh, the RNAi BT pyramided hybrids this year. If you use some of that RNAi seed corn to fight rootworm issues, let me know. We'll follow its progress with you through the growing season. Well, that concludes this edition of Midwest Ag This Week. We hope you benefited from some of the information that you've seen and heard, and hope you'll share it with your farming colleagues. On behalf of the Midwest Ag team, we invite you to join us again this time next week. I'm Stu Ellis, reminding you to be safe everywhere around the farm.